Hello and welcome to Dig School, cross-curricular learning themed around archaeology. This session is DIY Dig, when you're learning how to do your own archaeological test pit excavation. Key questions will be how to excavate the test pit, how to record it, and how to make the site good afterwards. We'll be going through every single one of the stages, all of which have been completed by young people of secondary school age but also by people digging with their families in their own gardens as well. The handbook and the record booklet that you can download from www.digschool.org.uk have all the instructions you'll need. And in the booklet, uh, there are sections to record everything that you need to make a permanent record of so that the discoveries you make will be able to be of use to people in the future. On the back of the both documents, there's a 20 step summary of the main activities you need to carry out to record and carry out the excavation, just as a reference. Now, as I'm running through the instructions, write down in your workbook each of the 20 steps that you'll need to carry out to do this excavation. So step one is to fill out all the boxes on the front cover of the excavation record booklet. That's the black and white booklet. And as you'll see, there's a number of questions to answer about the date of excavation, the name of the settlement, the address, and the names of the people involved in the excavation. This record booklet will be your archive record of your excavation. So it's very important that all of the information that can enable anyone to connect to the finds you've made, to the place you made those finds in, that all of that record information is recorded correctly in the record booklet. Step two is measure out a one meter square on the site that you've chosen to excavate. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to have a tape measure, uh, mark out the four corners with nails and then run string between the nails. You've then got some nice straight edges that will show exactly where to dig the easiest way to get the test pit square is to make sure that the all four sides are one meter long and that the diagonals are 1.41 meters long. Uh, the maths of a, a triangle is what gives us this measurement. If you check that your diagonal measurements are 1.41 and that your sides are all one meter, your test pit will be square. Have a look at it just to check it looks right as well. Step three is measure and draw a location sketch plan to record the location of your test pit. Now, this is really important because if you find something really important, someone might want to come back and have another look at it. And whatever you find, we'll need to know exactly where those finds came from. So on the page in your record booklet, the second page, you'll see there's a blank space for you to draw a map. Now, this needs to include permanent fixed features like buildings and property boundaries that someone else can find on a map and that someone can come to that property and see in the future. And it also needs to include measurements from those permanent fixed features to the centre of your test pit. Ideally, three measurements, which gives a sort of good, robust uh, triangle uh, that will enable someone to work their way to the site of your test pit. Think of it a little bit like a treasure map for someone in the future to enable them to find the site again. And at the bottom of the page, there's some space to actually describe where the test pit was as well, making it even easier for your treasure hunter to find your test pit site in the future. So looking at this diagram on the screen, you can see you've got a house, you've got a test pit, you've got a wall, you've got a path, lots of permanent features. Black dot marks one corner of the house, uh, the other black dot marks the other corner. Those are fixed points. Anybody coming back there can find those points again. So if you just check the measurement between those points so that somebody coming back in the future will know that the house is still the same size, uh, hasn't been enlarged. And if it has been enlarged, they can look to see where the original measurement would have taken them to. And then measure from each of those points to the centre of your test pit write those measurements down on your plan. And before you start drawing your plan, make sure you drew it, draw it so that north is to the top of the page. That's a standard mapping convention. 
So it's important to do a professional job and follow those conventions. Uh, you can use the compass on your phone or, of course, the direction of sunlight if it's sunny to work out which way north is. And then number the four corners of the test pit, and make it easier to sort of refer to them in the future. Uh, start in the top left hand corner, which is the northwest corner, and then go round in clockwise order. One, two, three and four. So you can see that diagram's got all of those um, measurements on it and it's got those four corners labelled. So now chance for you to have a practice go at this. So there's an aerial image here of a garden that's having a test pit dug in where the uh, white X is marking the spot. So in your workbook, draw a plan that would enable someone to find that test pit from the plan you've drawn, assuming they knew what the address of that house was. So you can invent an address for it and invent some measurements that would get from the corners of that house or the corners of the property boundary or any other fixed feature that would enable someone to measure from those to the test pit. Okay, now you've had a chance to um, do your own test pit location map. If you're doing some test pit digging, the next chance you'll have to do this will be for real. And of course, remember to mark on that map where north is. So on these, this, both of these maps, north is at the top of the page. Step four is lay out some plastic sheeting. Um, it's really helpful if you can get some plastic sheeting like a tarpaulin or something to put all the spoil from the test pit onto. It makes it a lot easier to uh, tidy it up afterwards, stops all the mud and soil getting on the grass. Um, if you put it a couple of metres from the test pit, it means that your spoil heap, your heap of earth that's come out of the uh, test pit you're digging, isn't too close to the test pit and won't get in your way when you're wanting to walk around the test pit. Step five is fill in the details on the top right hand side of the first context record sheet page in your excavation record booklet. This will be on page three of your record booklet. Now, your obvious question might be, what is a context? So once you've filled in those top boxes with the uh, site details, the test pit number, the first context you excavate is context number one, and also who's doing the recording, put the name of the person who's filling in that record in. You can then think about what a context is and why it has to be recorded. Now, this is about where the finds come from, and it's about stratigraphy, which is the layers of the past as you dig down. So you'll be digging your test pit in layers. Each layer is given a separate context number. And the context is where the finds from that layer have come from. So if you think about it, perhaps like a chest of drawers, in that each of those layers as you dig down into the ground is like one drawer from a tall chest of drawers. So your first context is your top drawer, that first highest one you come to. Now the reason we want to dig in those layers is because we want to keep those different contexts separate. Because if you start to get very different finds as you go further down, it will suggest you've hit a really different archaeological layer, which may be an intact layer from the past. So in the top drawer, for example, your top context, you might have quite modern pottery like this blue and white decorated ironstone china from the 19th century, just maybe 100 years or so old. As you go further down, you might have a bit of worked flint like this bit here from context four, from drawer four. Um, and you might think if there's no other finds in context four at all, if it's all flint or it's prehistoric pottery, you'd think you've got an undisturbed layer from the prehistoric period. But if you've kept the finds from each context separate, as you go on down, and then if you discover uh, right in the bottom layer some 20th century marbles, for example, That'll tell you for definite that those layers above must have been disturbed for those marbles to have got in at the bottom. So it's really important to keep those 10 centimetre contexts separate. Each layer you're digging your test bit is 10 centimetres thick. 
and if you keep the fines from each context separate, you won't have to worry about whether you have hit a different layer and not noticed it because you'll have kept those 10 centimetre layers separate anyway. So for each of those contexts, for each of those layers, for each of those drawers, if you like, we want to know what it was like before we started digging it. And for that, you fill in all the information on the left-hand side of the context record sheet. And then we want to know what we saw when it was being dug, what finds came out of it, what did the layer look like as you dug through it. And all of those questions on the right-hand side of the form are about the what did it look like when we were digging it answers. So context one, your top drawer includes the grass if it is there off the top of the test pit and then everything down to 10 centimetres. So step six is complete recording steps one to four on that context record sheet. So you fill in the top boxes and then there's four questions asking you about the depth of the top of that context. Well, for the first one, it's zero, of course, because you haven't started to go down at all. Um, and then it's asking you to do a drawing of the surface of that context. Now, it'll probably just be grass, uh, maybe with a few daisies on it. Uh, you can draw those in if you want to. If there's a patch of grass that looks different, if it's a different colour, um, or if there's anything else showing, then draw that onto that gridded plan. Now, your test pit is one metre square. That gridded box in your record booklet is 10 centimetres square. So you're drawing up one to 10 scale. So one centimetre on your page is 10 centimetres in the test pit. So here's an example of one that's been filled in. You can see the test pit laid out there. It's just grass, there's no features. So we just noted on the grid there that it's grass, no features. And then the bottom there, there's a chance to describe what you've drawn. Just another hint for someone in the future to tell them about what you've drawn. This is your one chance to create a message for someone else looking at your record who may not speak to you about it at all. If they've got your record. Step seven is line an empty finds tray with newspaper ready for any finds. As soon as you start digging, you may find finds, in which case you need to have something ready to put those finds into. Otherwise, it's just too easy to pop them on the edge of the test pit, pop them on the table, put them in your pocket, something like that, and then it's very easy for them to get lost. So have a, a tray or something there ready to put your finds into. And with that tray, with those finds, put a labelled finds bag because ultimately you'll put your cleaned and dried finds into that finds bag. So you might as well label it now and then keep it with the finds from that context all the way through. And that finds bag needs to have the date of the excavation, the address and postcode of the excavation, and the context number. So your first context is context number one. Step nine is then remove the turf, the grass, if there's any present, with a spade. Um, do this as neatly as possible. Uh, dividing it into 16 squares works quite well. You can divide the sort of test pit in half in both directions and then divide each of those quarters into half again. And you'll then get 16 squares of turf that are um, kind of not too heavy to lift, uh, but not too small that they just fall to pieces. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, students in the pictures here doing this by cutting down through the turf first of all and then sliding the spade underneath to sort of cut the squares of turf out. When you lay them down, if you do have some plastic sheeting, put them on top of that. Whatever you do with them, put them in the same order that they came out of the test pit. It will make it much easier to put them back again tidily when you come to finish your test pit and backfill it. It's like keeping all the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in the same order. Step 10 is to use a mattock or spade to loosen the soil in the test pit and then shovel to put it in a bucket so you can take it away. Keep the bottom of the test pit as level as possible while you're doing this and keep the sides straight. Try not to get any soil on the grass 
it'll just save time afterwards tidying it up if you haven't got soil on the grass in the first place. Step 11 is to sieve or hand sort every bucket full of soil over the plastic sheeting. Pick out anything and everything you see that looks as if it was made by humans. These are your finds. Tip the residue onto the spoil heap and then get the next bit of spoil and sort through that as well. If you don't know what to keep, keep it. If you're in any doubt about anything, just hang on to it. It's a lot easier to keep something, get it cleaned up, and then later dig school sessions will look at identifying finds and you'll be able to check things online and work out what you need to keep and what you don't. But if you throw something away while you're doing the digging, you're never going to look at it again. So you'll never know it was there. So if in doubt, hang on to it. And that includes little broken bits of glass and old worn bits of brick, bits of roof slate, rusty old nails, um, anything that you think was made by humans at some time or other. And there's a huge range of stuff that you might find. There is a pottery identification guide, which again, you can download or look at online. And um, there are lots of other resources that will give you as well, or help you identify finds. Uh, there'll be an archeologist on call uh, during dig week who you can ask about it. And then afterwards, uh, some of the really difficult to identify finds can be sent off to specialists to get those identified. But it's a challenge for you to identify as much as you can. Step 12 is clean the finds and place them in a finds tray to dry. Only put them in the plastic finds bags when they're completely dry. This will probably take several days. If you put them in when there's any moisture in them at all, you'll get condensation collect on the inside of the finds bag and then you've got mould growing and that really doesn't do finds any good at all. Don't wash anything that's made of metal, any glass that's become very sort of fragile. Um, laminated when it starts to discolour um, and get a sort of iridescent sheen to it, or friable pottery. If you've got something you think is pottery but feels very breakable, don't wash that. Other finds can be washed gently with a toothbrush and then laid out. Newspapers are a really good thing to put them on because it helps absorb the moisture uh, from uh, the finds washing uh, and put them out to dry. The best way to do the fines washing is actually to have two washing up bowls of water, one that you use to wash your find in and the other of clean water that you just rinse the dirty water off and then put it on your newspaper to dry. Make sure you change your water as often as possible, um, otherwise you'll discover when your finds have dried, they've still got a sheen of uh, dried mud on them and you'll have to wash them again. Step 13 is carry on uh, digging down until you get 10 centimetres below the surface across the whole of the pit. If your test pit's on a slope, then get to 10 centimetres at the deepest point and leave the bottom of your test pit level. Step 14 is then use a trowel or a hand shovel um, or even the big shovel to remove all the loose soil from across the bottom of the test pit, leaving the exposed surface neat and clean so that you can see if there's anything showing in the layer that is the next layer down you haven't dug yet. Step 15 is then to finish the rest of that context record. Remember, you recorded what the context looked like before you dug it on the left hand side. Now you need to record what did you see when you dug it on the right hand side. So there are boxes here to say what the soil looked like, how stony was it, how sandy was it, what percentage of it was soil or clay or charcoal. And there's a couple of boxes to write in other things if you've got lots of uh, something like chalk, for example, turning up in it. Um, give a rough indication of the colour. There's actually a colour matching chart in your handbook, so have a look at that to use the colours as guidelines. And there's some space at the bottom to list your finds as well. If you don't know exactly what they are, just put 15 pieces of pottery, uh, white with a blue pattern on it, or 12 pieces of pottery, uh, brown, uh, no shiny glaze. 
just a general description like that just helps match up the finds in the bag to the context if there's ever any confusion later on. And then at the top of that right hand side, there's a recording task checklist. You can tick each task off as you go. So did you photograph the top of the context before recording it? Did you draw a plan of it? Uh, what percentage did you sieve or did you hand sort it? Um, have you cleaned the finds? And then finally, have you filled in all of the boxes on that context record sheet? And that's the point to which you finish that context, that draw, that first top layer. So after you've given yourself a pat on the back and maybe had a snack and a drink and a bit of a rest, you can then start the next context down. So that's the second layer, the second draw, if you like, going down into time. So you then need to start a new context record sheet and that effectively takes you back to step five. Now, if you've been noting down in your workbook the steps as you've gone, you'll be able to look back and see what step five was because it can be quite easy to have forgotten that by that point. And of course, step five is fill in the details at the top of that context record sheet, that left hand side that says, what was it like before we dug it? So you just do exactly the same, fill in the boxes um, and fill in those four recording step questions, including drawing a plan of the surface of the pit in the gridded square. Now in this case, there's nothing showing, it's just a plain brown soil, there's no features, there's no difference, uh, there's no sort of one side of the test pit that's stonier than the others or wetter um, or a different colour. So which you could just say brown soil, Give an indication of the colour from the colour chart, no features. So that's what we've got recorded there. And just carry on digging down in 10 centimetre context, stopping every time you get to 10 centimetres, 20, 30, 40, and so on. Completing steps 8 to 16, going down to 16, back up to start again in a loop, filling in a new context record sheet for each context you dig. So that arrow there is showing how you sort of go down and then you loop back up to carry on through all of those different, uh, the same process for each different context as you get deeper and deeper and deeper. So this is just a sort of photo summary really. Record what you've done, loosen the soil, sieve everything, wash your fine, clean your finds, uh, Make sure you've got a bag for them and once they're completely dry, put them in the bag. Um, complete your records for the context and then start the next one. So you just go through this cycle again and again. Two basic hints as to how to do a really good job. Keep the spoil from the top two contexts separate from the lower layers. It's good practice to put the top soil, the salts come from the very top of an excavation back at the very top. It's obviously a lot easier to do if you've kept it separate. And keep the sides of your test pit as vertical, straight as possible, and keep the bottom of your test pit as flat as possible. You can see a really nice example here, done by a couple of students who were 14, 15 years old doing these excavations. So there are four reasons to stop digging. One is that you reach natural, which is the undisturbed natural ground surface before there were any humans there. Uh, natural won't have any finds in it at all. Um, you may though um, find there's 20 or even 30 centimeters in your test pit when you don't get any finds, but actually then there's finds in layers below. So even if you've had a layer with no finds or a couple of a couple of contacts with no finds, it's often worth keeping going, especially if the soil is very dark or it's still quite loose, um, unless you're absolutely certain that you're onto natural. It's always worth digging another 10 centimetres. Until you get to 120 depth, as soon as you get to a metre 20, then you have to stop digging uh, because for health and safety reasons, you're not allowed to dig any deeper than that without supporting the size of a pit. And that's just not enough space in a one metre square pit to do that. 
So the fourth reason slot digging is you run out of time. You may have a time limit on your excavation. Third limit, the third reason, is that you've come to a feature that you shouldn't dig through. As soon as you get to the point of stopping for any of those four reasons, then you go to page 14 in your booklet, your record booklet, and fill in the final context record sheet. Now, the left-hand side of this is exactly the same as all the others because it's saying, what was this context like before we dug it? It's looking at that surface. But the right-hand side is different because, of course, you're not going to dig that context because you've stopped whether because you've reached natural and there's no point digging any further, whether because you've got to a metre 20 and you can't dig any further, whether because you've run out of time and you can't dig any further, or because you've hit a feature and you need to stop because that might be an important archaeological feature that needs to be left intact. For whatever reason, you're not going to dig any further. So there's no fines to record on that right-hand side. There are no observations to be made about what that layer looks like as you dug it, because you're not going to dig it. So you won't see what it looked like and there won't be any fines. So there are some final pieces of information you need to record. So if you are stopping digging because you found a feature, and a feature is anything that looks like it's uh, something from the past that's been built there or dug there, or created there as a permanent fixture. So it might be a pit in the ground, it might be a wall that's been built, it could be a, a brick floor surface. If you're slopping because you found a feature, then you need to draw that carefully to scale in your record booklet. So the images you can see here are a couple of features. Uh, the one on the left-hand side uh, you can see is uh, that the uh, soil in the bottom left-hand corner of a pit is a very different colour to the soil in the top right-hand corner. And there's a very clear, distinct line separating them two. Now, if it was just a gradual fade, you could carry on digging. But in this case, it's very clear there's a very sudden difference. So that's definitely a cut feature of some description. And in the right-hand side, you can see there's a lot of stone making a quite regular line. And in fact, when you scrape a little bit between those stones, we saw that actually they were mortared in place still. We couldn't actually lift them up. If you've just got loose stones in your pit, you can take them out, record where they were, take them out and carry on digging. But if it's fixed permanently, you need to leave them in situ and record it. So, you record this on that grid in your booklet. Um, now you do this on the final context record sheet. Um, here's the detail of this. And you can see here we've drawn in the white line showing where the edge of that feature is that the uh, student is pointing to with their trowel. And there are four key points really at which that line changes direction. It's quite a simple feature to draw. So to do a scale plan of it, you simply measure in the test pit what distance those points are from the edges of the test pit, and then those mark them on the context plan, remembering that every 10 centimetres in your test pit is one centimetre on your piece of paper, because 10 centimetres on the piece of paper is the whole metre of the test pit. So here you've got those four key points shown as red crosses there, so those are then measured carefully in to those same points on the context plan. And then you can simply draw a dotted line, join them up. It's just dot to dot, really. And then note down what it is you're drawing. Remember, you're leaving a message for someone else in the future to look at this record. So note down that it's dark brown soil. They won't be able to look at it. Uh, they'll hopefully, take a if you've been able to take a photograph of it, they'll look at the photograph. But Maybe that's got lost or separated. And in any case, it won't have your real lived experience of seeing what that looked like. So note down, dark brown soil with lots of charcoal visible, colour two, using that colour chart. And on the other side, it's light brown clay, colour six, it says here, with bits of brick visible in it. And remember, brick's man-made. So that, again, is an interesting clue. It shows us that that... Uh, 
that lighter soil is not natural. It's got bits of brick in it. It must be some sort of archaeological feature. So you can see there where these points in the test pit relate to the mark points that have been marked on the context plan there. And then at the bottom of the page, again, there's a space to describe what you've drawn or what you think it might be. This is your, it's your final feature. You're not digging through it. What do you think it might have been? Any discussions you've had? So now you have a go. Here's this other feature that we looked at with all those solid stones. So this is a chance for you to draw a plan of that in your workbook. OK, so you've had a chance to draw that in your workbook. Now, um, there's lots of different ways you could have drawn that. Uh, you could perhaps draw the loose bits of stone in and just decide that the rest of it is a wall, it's a right angle corner of a wall, and just draw the edge of the wall in like this plan has here. You might have decided though to make a really careful job of it and draw all the individual stones in, still noting that uh, some of them are loose and that some of them are actually part of a wall. And for absolute perfection, you could even have sort of coloured in or shaded in the actual bits of stone. And that gives a really nice impression there of what that feature is, showing the difference between the feature and the soil that is sitting within. So this is what your final context record sheet would look like for that feature. You can see the walls in there, uh, the depth of the top of that context has been recorded. It's 90 centimetres below the surface, so it's a long way down. Um, and there's also been, um, uh, the uh, notes have been made about whether, the, the, the question on the right hand side is, did you get to natural? When no, you didn't because you stopped because you had a feature. And then there's also a bit of space where on the other context record sheets, you talk about the fines, this is just just give your summary, your kind of one sentence soundbite about what you think the story of your test pit was. Now, you might have a feature at the bottom of your test pit or you might not. You may have stopped because you got to natural or because you got to meter 20 or ran out of time, in which case your final context record sheet will look more like this one. Again, still at 90 centimetres, but there's no features. Um, but there's also the explanation that in this case, they did reach natural, um, so it confirms that they reached natural. They'd had no fines, in fact, uh, since 80 centimetres, so they'd had a clear 10 centimetres with no fines in at all. Um, and again, there's this summary of what's the kind of story. So the last thing to do then before you start filling your test bit in again is to record the sections, the layers that you've dug through. Now, in some cases, it might simply be dark brown topsoil at the top, a load of subsoil, and then your natural at the bottom. In other cases, like this example here, you can see there's several quite clearly distinctly different layers. So on page 15 of your record booklet, there's four squares that you can draw all four sides of your test pit, measuring down from the surface to the layers that you've dug through. So step 19 then is to backfill your test bit and replace any turf as neatly as possible. The best way to backfill the test bit, if you've got any large stones um, or uh, bits of um, sort of large amounts of say brick that you're only keeping one sample of because you don't want a whole ton of bricks, if you've had lots of them, keep one to give you an example of it, uh, put, the, put the big lumps and any bricks or or stuff that you're not keeping back in the bottom of the pit because you don't want to be trying to fit the turf back on the top of them on top of that at the top of the pit. Then put most of the rest of the spoil back, remembering to put the spoil from the top two contexts, those top layers nearest the surface, put that back at the top near the surface. It's much more nutrient rich. The plants that try to grow back afterwards will thank you for it if you put the nutrient rich soil back at the top. So will anyone who's trying to garden on the side. 
if you've been uh, if it's been very dry or if you've been digging sort of sticky soils like clay you may need to tread the backfield soil down quite firmly to get it to fit in and you might even need to jump up and down on it a bit but if it's been wet or if you're digging on sandy soil it's very easy to over compact it so don't jump up and down on it and don't tread it down too hard unless until you're absolutely clear that you definitely need to uh, otherwise you can end up with when you put the turf back it's below the ground surface and that's a real pain so go carefully um, fill your test pit back in when you've got all of the soil back in and just the turf are left to go on top place those back in exactly the same order. This is the point at which you'll be really pleased that you put them all in the right order when you took them off in the first place because they'll slot back in really easily, just like putting a jigsaw puzzle or Rubik's Cube back into place. And take a bit of time to fit the edges neatly together. You can tread them gently down with your heel um, to get them to fit nicely together. Um, and you should end up, once you've brushed the loose soil away, with a test pit that really looks very, very neat. And once the grass has grown over a couple of weeks, it'll be really very difficult to see that it was ever there. All you will have, of course, is the fines and the records that you've kept, which are telling you what is hidden, what came from that space that is now hidden back again. Um, who knows what you'll find in your test pit? Um, it could be almost anything. Uh, always remember, though, that as you get deeper, if you get into earlier layers, you'll get fewer fines. Two or three pieces of pottery from a whole 10 centimetre context of medieval or Anglo-Saxon or Roman date is a lot. So don't be discouraged if you start getting fewer fines, but you're still getting fines. That often tells you you're getting to the earlier bits. And they're often the most interesting because they're the bits we know least about from modern records. And of course, because we've done lots of these test pit excavations elsewhere, we'll know exactly how unusual or how uh, typical the finds you're making are. And we'll look at that in later dig school sessions. And whether you're digging in a school playground or in a garden where you've been homeschooling, um, this one meter square test pit excavation will enable you if you follow the instructions we've just gone through to do an excavation that makes valuable archaeological finds and leaves the site looking in good condition as well. So uh, we aim to look at how to excavate a test pit, how to record the excavations and how to make the site good afterwards. Um, I hope you've enjoyed finding out about that. You've had a bit of a chance to practice some of those skills. You've written down your 20 key points. And uh, now you can think about where you might like to dig. We'll talk about that in the next dig school session. So I hope you enjoyed DIY dig and hope to see you at another dig school sometime soon. Thank you.